now is the hour. Join in the song here in this place where all belong. All are welcome, all invited to open hearts and open minds. In our living, in our serving, may we always be searching for truth. Please join me in our call to worship printed in your bulletin. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will take from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Praise God who keeps the promise. Come, let us worship God together.
let us join in our opening prayer. Gracious and loving God, you begin with a promise, not only to us, but to all creation, earth and sea and sky. Help us rise to that promise as our spirits rise in praise this day. Wake us to new dimensions of your love for us, to your grace in our lives, to your hopes for all of the places where we live and work and learn and play. Fill us and move us to share your love, your grace, your hope with an aching world. Let us be people of your promise, O God. We ask through Jesus Christ, who loves us and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. People of Plymouth Church, I don't know what kind of morning you've been having. I don't know what you were dealing with before you came into this place, and I don't know what's waiting for you once you leave. But I know this, our God is a deliverer. God is on your side, ready to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. All you have to do is stand still. We belong to a God who loves us and who is leading us into life. So with glad hearts, let us rejoice and sing.
Thank you, Cherub Choir. That was beautiful. Can I ask you guys to scoot over this way where you can take a look at the blessing that's about to happen? Thank you. People of God, today we celebrate the faith journey with those who have been part of the seventh grade class for families this year, seventh graders starting the confirmation journey and their families. Would you seventh graders and families come forward? As they're coming up, I'll tell you all a little bit about what we do in these classes. When kids are born, why not come up and stand on the steps? When kids are born, when they're toddlers, when they go off to school, when they receive communion and start reading, when they're able to grasp the importance of saying, I'm sorry, and ask for forgiveness, when they take part in the confirmation journey, and when they graduate from high school, these are important rites of passage in a life of a family. We've got a big class of seventh graders this year. This is awesome. Just keep scooting in and find a place to be together. These are also times in the life of our church when we ask families to come together here at Ply Plymouth um, to participate in classes designed to help families get through these times of transition, share what's happening in their lives, and deepen their relationships with one another and with God. So at the end of each class, we ask participants to come together here in worship to make promises to one another and to receive a blessing from the congregation as a sign and symbol that we are all in this together. We belong to one another because we belong to God. Seventh graders, you are at the start of a journey that's going to give you more independence and also ask a little more responsibility from you, too. You're going to gain a new small group community and learn some things that you can bring home to teach your families. So as you start this journey, take this blessing from your families with you. Parents, families, I'm going to ask you to look into your child's eyes and repeat after me. It's okay to turn your backs to the congregation for this, okay, guys? Parents, I invite you to say your child's name and repeat after me. You are my child, and you are precious to me. I love you, and I want to be here for you. So I offer you my blessing for this confirmation journey. May you always have more questions than answers. May you learn much and come home to teach us what you've seen. May you grow in community and in love. Amen. Parents and seventh graders, you are not alone. All of these people in this congregation also get to bless you for the journey ahead. So I'm going to invite you guys to make your way down the center aisle with me. It's a big crowd. I think we can stretch all the way back. And congregation, I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able and reach toward the center aisle so that you can lay hands of blessing on seventh graders and their family. Matins is getting in on the action. That's most excellent. And if you can't reach the center aisle, I invite you to lay a hand on the shoulder of someone who can until we are all connected in this big blob of blessing. And I invite you to repeat after me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. On this day and all the days ahead. 
May your home be a place of joy and peace. And your family truly blessed. From this day on and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, as always, children are more than welcome in worship, and we also have church school available at this time. If that is what your family is ready for, you may head that way now. We just did a lot of moving, so I invite you to get your feet planted firm on the ground and take a deep breath or two as we enter into prayer with one another. The Spirit of God be with you. Let us pray. First, in the space of silence, taking to God the prayers on our hearts. Creator God, God of justice, God of mercy, God of steadfast love. We come before you this morning trusting in your presence and your love in the world. We lift the silent prayers of our hearts to you. God, life is so often full of pain and loss. Help us to be fully present for the moments of joy and health and fullness so we don't miss them as they come. Help us to be here, right here, so we may experience your grace that is falling on us at every moment. God, this week the story of Tamar sits heavy on our hearts. We heard her story this summer, and we pray that you keep our hearts and ears open as we continue to hear stories that are far too similar to hers. God, we pray for all your children who have suffered sexual assault. We pray for all 
who are suffering anew this week as these topics take national stage. We are grateful for those brave people who, like Tamar, refuse to be silenced. Help us to treat one another and ourselves tenderly and compassionately as we face painful realities. Help us to break the chains of isolation and silence. Help us to break the chain of shame. Help us to speak and to listen and to grieve and to seek justice and to heal. And help us to rejoice in the resurrection life that you offer to us. We pray for all who are tasked with making decisions that affect many. Help us all remember that each person, each animal, each tree, every part of your creation is beloved. For all your people struggling to find shelter today or a hot meal or a job or affordable health care, God, we pray. For all who have been affected by the tsunami and earthquake in Indonesia, we pray. For all who are in pain, God, we pray. God, you are the God of liberation who led your people, Israel, out of Egypt. Today, help us to hear your call as you lead each of us to freedom. Help us to lean in, to stand tall, to live with open hearts and brave spirits as we seek your beloved community. God, we need you and your work in the world. Help us to be more fully a part of it each and every day. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.
A reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 14. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the minds of Pharaoh and his officials were changed toward the people, and they said, What have we done letting Israel leave our service? So he had his chariots made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 picked chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers all over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites, who were going out boldly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his chariot drivers and his army. They overtook them, camped by the sea, by Piharath and in front of Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. The angel, of the, Lord, the angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night, and one did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched his hand out over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on the dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptian said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord God is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Here ends the reading.
please be seated. Good morning. People of God, will you pray with me, please? Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today's reading picks up the biblical story several hundred years after the Joseph story that we heard about last week. Quick recap, Joseph got out of prison, ended up helping Pharaoh fend off a famine, reunited with his family during that time, and all of the Israelites came to Egypt to wait out the famine. And since they prospered there, they stayed. That is, until a new king arose who feared them and enslaved them, putting them to work on massive building projects for his gain. Today's reading was long, but it's cinematic and action-packed, filled with the whole range of humanity. We pick up as the wheels have literally been set in motion after 400 years of slavery. God hears the cries of the Israelites and through Moses promises to bring them out. But that doesn't happen peacefully or easily. Prospering off the glut of free labor, Pharaoh does not want to give up his power over the Israelites. Even after suffering through plagues and finally deciding to let them go, Pharaoh changes his mind at the last minute, asking, what have we done? letting Israel leave our service. So he mounts an army to chase them down. Sounds like just the thing a villain, someone we love to hate, would do. But then there's this sticky wicket that jumps out of scripture, people of God. It trips me up. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Not Pharaoh's heart hardened against the Israelites, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. This obstacle in the text is something I don't want to just gloss over because we talk a lot here at Plymouth about God loving all creation and blessing all people through Abraham and his descendants. But God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Does that mean that when people do bad things, it's because God made them? And then God punishes them for it? What kind of cruel puppet master is that? As I think about what I know to be true about God, and about Pharaoh, as related in this story, I get an inkling that there could be more to the story than that. I wonder, could God have hardened Pharaoh's heart if Pharaoh didn't have practice hardening his heart already? Would God? Could God have hardened Pharaoh's heart if Pharaoh had not already ignored the cries of those suffering bondage at his hand? Could God have hardened Pharaoh's heart if Pharaoh had not grown greedier, calling for the Israelites to make even more bricks with less straw? Could God have hardened Pharaoh's heart if Pharaoh had not committed genocide, killing Hebrew boy babies for fear of them taking over and diluting the gene pool? Could God have hardened Pharaoh's heart if Pharaoh had not denied the immigrant people in his land the right to go out and worship in their own way? 
I can't be certain, but I think not. And I'll tell you why, people of God. Because I know what it's like to have a hardened heart, to feel righteous indignation, and even while treasuring mercy, hold some secret hopes about the wrath of God. Anyone else? A pastor friend of mine who makes soap posted a picture of her wares on social media recently, joking, Well, since bathing in the blood of my enemies isn't a legit option this week, why not soap? She was taking orders. I know what it's like to have a hardened heart. I also know that every time, every time I turn to God with intention, seeking guidance with humility, My heart is tenderized, softened, and broken open. I breathe a little more deeply. I trust. The frayed edges at the end of my nerves start to calm and grow more steely, reclaiming their boldness and their kindness. My tenderized heart is strengthened in its resolve to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. My experience hews to the promise Ezekiel testifies to, words we shared in our call to worship this morning. When I come to God knowing my heart needs a tune-up, God lives into his promise. A new heart I will give to you. And a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Those who come to God even hoping to loose their heart of stone are heard. But that is not Pharaoh, people of God. Driven by a thirst for power, not just to rule, but to dominate. Driven by a fear of what would become of him if he ceded that power, if the tactics he had employed against others were suddenly turned against him, Pharaoh easily falls into an old pattern. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So he has his chariot made ready, and he takes his army with him, 600 picked chariots, and then all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And he pursues the Israelites who were going out boldly. The Egyptians pursue them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his chariot drivers and his army, and here they overtake the Israelites camped by the sea. Can you see it? The masses of Israelites moving out of Egypt as quickly as they can, only to be followed by the sleekest, fastest, most tripped-out war chariots and army in the world. The Israelites started by going out boldly. But when they reach the sea, the first real obstacle to their exit, they look over their shoulders, and the Egyptians are right there. In this moment, the Israelites fray, fearing this is the end of them. They look for someone to blame for their vulnerability and seem to be swept up in sudden nostalgia for their lives in slavery. They say to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done? bringing us out of Egypt. Is this not the very thing we told you? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. I know something of this feeling too, people of God. Maybe you do as well the frayed nerves that look back at how things used to be, prizing what brought pain because at least it was known, harmful, but at least dependable. 
And so when I read this story today, I see a spectrum of human response to stress. With hardened hearts doubling down with ruthlessness and power on the one hand, and these frayed nerves becoming a quivering mass of anxiety on the other. And then I look at our world. I look at myself. And it's like the text is a mirror. This is so much of what I see in our world right now, people of God, hard hearts and frayed nerves, growing polarization, the pressure to plant ourselves firmly in one camp or another, hardening our hearts to each other while also experiencing a kind of reactivity and strange twilight zone nostalgia that comes with frayed nerves, wishing for how things used to be the blinders that go up to prevent creative thinking, the lack of trust, the inability to see a way forward, hard hearts and frayed nerves. People of God, would you believe me if I told you this is exactly the opposite of what we need and what our moment calls for? Instead of hard hearts and frayed nerves, imagine tender hearts and nerves of steel. We need hearts that stay open to each other, hearing and believing each new truth that comes to us. We need the ability to stay in relationship without the reactivity that causes us to judge and guess another's motives or shut down instead of open up or lean into resentful knowing instead of gracious curiosity. Now it's important to note that different ones of us may be in different places on this spectrum of hard-hearted to frayed nerves or a mix of both. For those who have had trauma and abuse enacted upon you, hear me say, it is not your job to stay in open-hearted relationship toward your assailants or abusers. Before we get to this point in our story, the Israelites had already cut that cord. They went out boldly from their oppressor. God said no to the evil of oppression. For those who don't identify as a survivor of abuse, trauma, or oppression, hear me say, it is not the job of survivors to stay in open-hearted relationship that could do them more harm. It is their job to take care of themselves first, to get free, and to heal. So, the Israelites have stepped out boldly. They have tried to open a new chapter in their lives, and the moment they see danger pursuing them, they understandably freak out. But then they start idealizing the past and looking for someone to blame. Moses is in that spot. They see water in front of them, their oppressors behind, and their lives feel very small and vulnerable, and they can see no way through. But they have forgotten one important component of their story that I know I often forget too, people of God. And I wonder if you do as well. They have forgotten the presence of God. Because the moment after their freak out, their nerves frayed and raw, God's voice speaks to them through Moses saying, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to keep still. Don't be afraid. Stand firm. See deliverance. You have only to keep still. Not be still and be captured, but be still and take a deep breath. Remember who you belong to. You have done your part. You have gone out boldly. Now trust 
That just as God was with you in the last step, God will be with you in the next one. And in the next moment, God literally has the people's back. I had forgotten this part of the story, people of God. This is right from the text. The angel of the God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. God's angel is their rear guard. God has their back. And then God does something that no one could have imagined. When there was nowhere to go and no one knew what to do, God makes a way where there was literally no way only moments before. That is what God does, people of God. God makes a way where there was no way before. It is hard to see that way out of no way if our nerves are so frayed with backward-looking anxiety that we can't see straight. It's hard to recognize that way out of no way if our hearts are so hardened with anger and animus that we can't see any possibilities beyond our own creation or even the humanity of those who disagree with us. Which brings me to the end of the story and the matter of all those dead Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians. So Moses stretched out his hand and the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. Did God really do that? If that's the case, when people attribute bad things in their lives to God's punishment, this story turns out to be very citable. How do we make this jive with our God of love? Again, an inkling, people of God. I know and trust that God promises us grace. But I also know that God does not extend grace to unjust institutions that are practicing oppression. Because God also promises justice. As a symbol, Pharaoh's army, an instrument of oppression, violence, and war, was an institution that was maybe in need of collapse. If it couldn't survive without, without forced labor, Maybe it deserved to drown under the weight of its own armor. Martin Luther King even wrote a sermon about this passage entitled, The Death of Evil on the Seashore, depersonalizing those who drowned, lifting Pharaoh's army up as a symbol of evil. But if we read this end more personally, I think it does and should give us some pause. What about all those people on the seashore? How do we avoid celebrating the fall of our enemies? How do we recognize the tendency toward hard hearts and frayed nerves in all of us? And once safely on the other side of our own Red Sea crossings, open ourselves up to God's work of healing so we do not turn to violence ourselves, whether physical or emotional? How do we make sure that we don't become the thing we hate? It's the work of a lifetime, I think, and it begins with trust that the work is bigger than us. It is in God's hands and available to us when we ask. In my life, God's way out of no way has never quite looked like the parting of waters and the rolling back of waves in the sea. But when I stop long enough to know I am in the presence of God, I find that God makes a way reveals options I would not have imagined, 
And instead of fretting about all I have to do, God reminds me that her work is that of liberation and healing and new life. All I have to do is have the courage to boldly walk the road that opens up before me with a tender heart and nerves of steel. Simple, right? I pray you be with me on that journey. May it be so. Amen. People of God, our job is not to fix every broken thing that we see in the world and set it up in our image, but to stay open to the work of God. One of the ways we do that is by pooling our resources and trusting that together they will open up pathways to liberation and new life that we couldn't have imagined on our own. Giving up control of some of our stuff is both a tender-hearted and steely-nerved thing to do. So I invite you into that practice now with our morning offering. We've prayed with no proof anyone could hear In our hearts a hopeful song we barely understood Now we are not afraid Although we know there's much to fear We were moving mountains long before we knew we could there can be miracles when you believe. Though hope is frail, it's hard to kill. Who knows what miracles you can achieve when you believe somehow you will. You will when you
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for your work of liberation in the world. We thank you for the ways you say no to oppression and evil, for the ways you open up new pathways where we couldn't have imagined and use them to channel new life. Bless our gifts. Use them for the life-giving purposes we know about, like church school, confirmation, and high school youth programs that help our young people grow in their connection to each other and to you. And let them plant seeds for things we haven't even imagined yet. Until all people are flourishing and free, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. People of God, whether or not you came into this place this morning with a heart that felt a little hard or nerves that felt a little frayed, I hope you go from this place with heart a little more tender, nerves a little steelier, soul a little more assured of God's presence in your life and at work in the world. Carry that with you to share it with confidence and kindness with all you meet and carry this blessing as you go. Now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen.